Um, I'll pass these around, but I can I can grow these cells. They're yeah, they're really cheap to buy, and I can put them in like a little biochip, like a little handheld biochip. It has like a little port on it. You can connect it with a little syringe, inject your little neurons in there, or your kidney cells, or whatever, and then they the cells grow in there. So here's a picture of the cells. Like, see each one of these little like circles is a cell, and the cells will like attach down onto these like gold electrodes. There's gold electrodes that are patterned on here. So that's the picture here of these gold electrodes. And the real key to this whole idea is, sure, I, anyone can grow cells on a chip, but like how are we going to measure if the cells are done? Like how am I going to, how am I going to know the difference between like a healthy cell and a hurt cell? And so I came up with an idea. There's actually a company measuring um, health of cells through something called electrical impedance. So what you can do is you can grow the cells on the electrode and you hook up this chip to a device that actually um, applies a current to the to these electrodes. And the electrons are going to flow from the negative electrode over to the positive electrode. So you'll have this like electron flow. And when you have cells on the electrodes, the cells physically impede that ion flow. It, it, it physically like doesn't allow the electrons to go to the other to go to the other electrode. The, the um, electrons have to go like under the cells and through the cells, and it, they get impeded. And you can measure that really sensitively and really cheaply with like a little handheld device, which is perfect what the army was looking for. So I'm gonna pass that around if you guys want to look at that. So we had an idea of using cells. We had this idea of using electrical impedance, which is really cheap. Um, and so we we did that, and we grew cells from all different parts of the body. We started adding. The army was like, this is when I was still in Ithaca. Well, it happens at SUNY Portland too. The army's like mailing me all these chemicals, and uh, we started looking at is this, is this actually going to work? And so we I have a whole bunch. I'm just going to show you one. Uh, this is mercury, and so what you're seeing here is you're look, looking at the impedance. I just normalized it so it's easier to look at. So just the, the electrical impedance versus time. So this is one hour. The army wanted to see everything in, in an hour or less, which is insane. And what I did is I added different concentrations of mercury. The control had no mercury in it at all. And you see like a normal impedance, and then you add the chemicals and the control didn't really do anything over time. The really low dose of mercury didn't significantly do anything. But then like the 10 mg per mil and the or mg per meter and the 50 really uh, we saw a significant change in impedance. You actually see a decrease in impedance. Because what's happening is the cells are really healthy and they're all on the electrodes and they're creating a really high impedance. And then mercury will start to sort of hurt them cells actually start pulling apart and the impedance will start to drop. The electrical flow isn't impeded anymore. Okay, it's super sensitive, it's super fast. Um, and we did this, this is just a small table, but we did this with all different kinds of chemicals, all different kinds of cells from all different parts of your body, and we showed that it actually works, which is really cool. Um, where we are now with this, because I, uh, is that, What's interesting about chemicals in your body is that chemicals are really specific. So there's some chemicals that will kill you because they're going to hurt your neurons. There's some chemicals that will kill you because they're going to fuck open your blood vessels. There's some chemicals that will kill you because they're going to hurt your kidney. So what we've kind of come up with the army is having like a multi-panel um, thing where we have different cells from different parts of your body all on like different chips. So we can cover all the different modes of action. And so that's what we've done with that. And then, <clears throat> this is, I thought this, you guys would be interested in this. So, interestingly, um, I, you can put cells on a chip and you can add chemicals and it works, and that's awesome. But then the army wanted us to make it really feel portable. And this was our first attempt at making that little chip that I'm passing around. See this little chip right here? That's, that's literally one chip. 
and this whole suitcase has been created to keep that chip alive for two weeks. That whole craziness, it took us like two years of engineering effort to make that stupid little suitcase to keep that chip alive for two weeks. It's not practical at all. It costs a lot of money, and it's not practical. So the take-home message is that when you put human cells in this chip, anything mammalian that is 98.6 degrees that requires a lot of nutrients that I need to constantly feed it glucose and amino acids, I need to give it oxygen, I need to get rid of the CO2, it's super um, energy intense. And so you need to have this little media bag where you're feeding it, you need to have heaters for it. So you can't take this chip out into the field, it's too, too hard. Um, we did get a little more complicated over time with our devices and we, we got this little cell hotel thing that could actually um, support like 10 chips at once, which is really cool. And you can mail this in the mail, but it was still like way too complicated. The Army wanted something that was like cells that were room temperature or cells that you put in the refrigerator and take out almost like, you know, pregnancy dipstick or something that's like super easy, like you store it for an hour or a year and then you can take it out. So we decided that human cells are not going to work um, and that we should start looking at other organisms. And so this is really cool. So do you guys know what, an, what ectothermic animals are? Have you guys ever heard that in biology, what like an ectothermic animal is? No. Um, so there, you know when you guys see a snake on like a really cold day, what does the snake do? It's doing nothing, right? It's, it's basking in the sun, it's like barely moving, it's super cold. So ectothermic animals, really interestingly, their metabolism um, it, and their core temperature and their metabolism varies with the external temperature. So on a really cold day, a reptile is going to have a really slow metabolism, it's not going to move at all. Um, and, and so what we found, which is so cool, is that you can take like reptiles, they have this temperature range, or you can take like a cold water fish that has this temperature range, and if you put those cells in a closed biochip, seal it up and store it for, um, we store these for three months at different temperatures, you'll see that like the cold water fish, for example, I can store that the cells in that biochip for close to two to three months when I store them in the refrigerator, and they're completely alive and they're super happy because those cells are in this hypometabolic state. They're not really using nutrients, they're not using oxygen, they're not producing CO2, so they're perfectly happy, sealed up, doing nothing. And I can do the same thing with reptiles. I can take reptiles that have this temperature range, store them at 20 or 25 degrees, which is like room temperature, which is super cold for these organisms, and they will last for three months in biochips sealed up doing nothing. And so we, the Army now has taken this data and they have built an entire commercial project based on cold water fish, where you can literally put fish cells in the biochip, put them in the refrigerator for a year, ship them around in little portable refrigerators all around the world, <coughs> take the chips out of the refrigerator, and use them in testing. And this is literally a commercial product right now. Uh, this, is, uh, this is some of the pictures of my Army collaborators. They went, they were doing testing with the system at a, like a portable Army camp in San Antonio, and they were teaching real military people like how to use the system, which is really easy. And so they've just made 350 units of these biosensors, and they're shifting them all around um, different water treatment plants, different army um, bases um, to test out to, to use in the real world. So I'm, I'm just, um, yeah, it's, it's so exciting as a scientist to work on a project that I started in 2001 that now is like really a, a product. Like I was involved with it, and I came up with the initial idea, which is just so, so cool. So I'm, I'm still getting funded from the Army, so they, they have this commercial product, but of course they're constantly looking to make it better, so I'm still working with the Army, testing different cells that could be even better than what we have now. And so we're, um, Lucas and Brittany are helping with me with that, with that experiment. And just one other thing I want to talk about, just one slide. So I also just found out, I got this 
other research grant, which is going to make me really stressed out, but it's super interesting. So I just got this other research grant from the United States Army Research Office at Research Triangle Park. They're really interested in detecting chemical and biological agents that could be aerosolized. So in the air, how are we going to detect those? Like if some terrorist aerosolizes something over like a concert or something, how are we going to know what that is? And so we're going to do a biosensor idea where we're making like a bioelectronic nose. So you guys actually have olfactory neurons in your nose that have receptors for 350 distinct chemicals. And the combination of those receptors allows you to smell 10,000 different distinct odors. And so we're going to take those olfactory neurons and try to make a biosensor out of them. Um, I don't have anything to report because it hasn't started yet, but I am super excited to make a bioelectronic nose. So stay tuned for the next conversation. Brittany's <laughs> working on it really hard right now. <laughs> okay, and this. Um, this is, Mr. Crocker made me add this, but if anyone, okay, so this is my last slide. So if any, I am the pre-med advisor at SUNY Portland, and I know some of you might be interested in going into healthcare, so I just wanna say like a couple things about that. So what I do at SUNY Portland is I help students get into these, into these professional programs. So they would go to SUNY Portland, do their four years there, and then they go to these programs after. Um, we have students going, we have a lot of students going into nursing, PA, uh, MD, and physical therapy. And so I just have like, a couple words about, like if you guys are interested in this, I certainly can talk to any of you after, or you can email me anytime and I can give you any advice. Um, but what is the advice I want to give you? Uh, uh, nursing, if, you're, if you are 100% sure right now that you want to be a nurse, then you should not come to SUNY Portland. Sorry, Bruce. You should not come to SUNY Portland because we don't have a nursing program specifically, okay? We do have a great health department and a biology department, which I'm part of, and you could get a BS in those, but then you would have to get into an accelerated nursing program, so you'd have to go to four years of college and then a year um, accelerated nursing program to get a BS in nursing. So you basically transfer all your courses into a nursing program. Um, so if you're not absolutely sure that you want to be a nurse, you definitely don't want to go right into a BS in nursing, because if you get a BS in nursing, all you can do is be a nurse. So if you're not sure, you should start with health or biology, which can do a wide range of things in healthcare, and then transfer into a nursing program. But if you're sure, then you can leave Dryden, I mean, get your degree at Dryden, and then you can go right into an associate's degree, get your RN, and they'll pay for you on the job to go back and get your, your bachelor's of science in nursing, which is what you want to do because then someday you might want to go back and get your master's and you can make more money and have more responsibilities um, and do all that. We have a ton of, when I started at SUNY Portland 11 years ago, PA was just coming on the scene and now there's a ton of PAs. I'm sure all of you, have, like, you don't even see a doctor anymore. You either see an NP or a PA. We have a ton of students that go into PA you have to major in something biology. It's so science prereq heavy that you need to be a major in biology, biomedical sciences, or biochemistry. Um, and I can talk to students more about that. So you would come to a four-year school, get all those prereqs, and then you'd go to a PA program for two years, and then you get out being a physician assistant, making a ton of money. You make like 70, 80,000 starting. So that is a very good career. Uh, MD is also an awesome career. We have a lot of um, students trying to get into this. And what I say about that is there's not as many prereqs to get into an MD program, which is surprising because the school is so long and there's so many courses you have to take to be an MD that they don't really care. They want you to be a super intelligent student with the bare minimum, or I mean, some, some science prereqs, but not that many. So you can be any major you want. If you're not a science major, though, you might have to add a bio or a chem minor. So I have psych, uh, psychology students, I have kinesiology students, I have speech and hearing science students, uh, philosophy students um, that get into med school. So you don't have to be a bio student. I mean, a majority of students are bio students, but you don't have to be a bio student. Um, in physical therapy, uh, this is a DPT program, it's a doctorate program. It's three years past 
class in undergrad, and I would definitely major in something biology or like exercise science or athletic training um, was what most of the students major in. And we have a ton of students that go on to physical therapy. So um, if you guys have any questions, I will answer any questions we have, either now or later. And oh. yes. <laughs> This is what usually happens in our household is Travis does all the work and the kids just watch. <laughs> Thanks guys. Um, I'm, I'm going to let my research students talk to you and then maybe we'll do questions at the end. Does that make sense? So my research students are current um, seniors at SUNY Portland and I just brought them because they're way more current. <laughs> they're going through the process right now so I thought they could give you some words of wisdom about what it's like to be a college student and how to do it right. <laughs> so, thanks guys for your attention. Which is the gene expression. 
And I was really into that too. So I go to her and she was like, okay, send me your resume and I'll take you on. So she took me on. Then my junior year, I took human physics with Dr. Curtis. And I go up to her again and I'm like, hi, Dr. Curtis, like, tell me about your research. So she told me and I was like, oh, like, do you have any openings? And she's like, I would love to have you as a student. I was like, mm hmm, you turned me down last year. <laughs> labs at SUNY Cortland, and I found a passion for research. I love research. I also love uh, the idea of becoming a doctor and helping people and like diagnosing problems. So my current goal right now is to attend SUNY Upstate and either get my MD or a combined MD-PhD program. So with the MD-PhD, you get those two degrees in about seven years. Um, so it's a lot of time, but I feel like it's so worth it, and it'll be so rewarding at the end. Um, other than my research and classes, I am a part of clubs. I like being involved in campus. I love to be busy. So I'm part of two different clubs. I'm on the exec board for both of them, and I do intramural soccer. And I also have three jobs on campus. Um, so really get involved in your campus because you'll just love it that much more. SUNY Cortland is great for getting involved and the bio department is hands down the best department there is there. All of the professors are willing to help you stay late. Like, they're just great. So that's a little bit about me. I talked a lot, I'm sorry. <laughs> so this is Lucas. Uh, Brittany's very active. I give her all the credit in the world. That is extremely tough to do. Like, they're wonderful. <laughs> but what I wanted to talk about is how I got here, which is probably different than most, like Brittany. She came to Portland right out of high school. She kind of had an idea what she wanted to do. But out of high school, I had no idea what I wanted to do. I was an athlete. I focused on sports throughout high school. I played soccer. I was a state champion my sophomore year. We went to states my senior year. And um, I was very good track athlete. I did pentathlon. I was going to sectionals all the time. Um, and then I graduated. And, or I was about to graduate. Senior year, and I was like, alright, what am I going to do? I don't have any colleges in mind. My mom showed me a program at Hudson Valley, which is a community college in Albany. And uh, she showed me a program, a PE program, with a bunch of courses that she thought were up my alley courses that I'd be interested in. And I was like, all right, I'll give it a shot. It's Hudson Valley. It's two years. It's cheap. I go there. And Hudson Valley was a great, great stepping stone for me because uh, they did a great job of like guiding you through, giving you good advice, but not holding your hand. So you kind of learn a little bit of independence there at Hudson Valley. You commute to school. You have your own responsibilities. You go to class. You come home. You're still at home, so it's like nice, and you don't have like the the pressures of being an on-campus student and dealing with peer pressure and all that. What, like, <laughs> God, I didn't have to deal with any of that. I'm just saying, I didn't have to deal. I with didn't that. have to deal with that either. <laughs> but I had this one professor who taught anatomy and physiology. Great guy, and he really got me interested in the human body, human physiology, and because of him, I decided to pursue more education. So I was like, all right, what can I do now? I had some family that attended Cortland, so I uh, looked at Cortland only, actually. I only looked at Cortland. And I applied for exercise science, and I got in. So I was like, okay, I'm going to Cortland <laughs> for exercise science. Awesome. And I get here, and I was not really happy where I was. I was, um, I was going to class. I was, I was like doing the bare minimum because like I almost wasn't challenged enough to do more. So I was doing what I was supposed to do and I wasn't really intrigued with it. So I was like, all right, why am I here? Why am I like wasting my time and money? So I figured that I should be studying something that I'm interested in and something that I can get a good career from. So that's when I decided to look at other majors like biochemistry or biomedical science. And I chose biomedical science because 
the courses that I was going to take, I thought were interesting, and I knew I could get a good job with a biomedical science degree in my hand. So that's how I became a biomedical science major. And I'll tell you what, it is hard. It is very hard. From high school, where I was just an athlete, didn't really put too much time in towards school, to all right, now I'm a biomedical science major. I have to study every single day of the week, or I will fall behind. And that's when I like realized that like I have to put in so much more time than I thought I would. It's like, oh, I studied for four hours. Like, okay, that's not enough. You need to study all the time. You need to be on top of your work. You need to be ahead of your work. So when I started biomedical science, my first semester, I only took three courses. I took Intro to Bio 1 and Intro to Bio 2 and Gen Chem 2. And it was only three courses, but I got my butt whooped. <laughs> it was so hard and it was so time consuming, but I loved what I was learning. And it was, it was, uh, it was rewarding and it was challenging. It was a love-hate relationship, but in the end, it's what I'm passionate about. And that's what I want to like let you guys know. Like, pursue what you're passionate about, because you have so much potential right now as young high school students. Like, you can do whatever you want to do. You just have to figure it out, and you have to be persistent. So, that's what I want to like let you guys know. You don't have to be like, I have to get ready. I have to go to medical school. I got to get all this stuff down right now. If you don't know what you want to do, I recommend to go to a community college get your gen eds done, major in something that you're interested in when you're at a, a community college, and then if you're interested in it enough, you can pursue higher education in it, and then if you are at a four-year school where you uh, are still interested in it, you're learning about what you're interested in, you, can, you feel like you can get a job after four years, do that, but if you feel like you need more school, like you need to go to med school to become a doctor, you have to go to med school, that's when you need to really put in the hard work. You, it's, it's, it's tough and it's really rewarding. That's what I want to let you guys know. Awesome. So as college students, are you guys, are you guys like worried about the debt? Personally, money on it? <laughs> personally, I'm not too worried about it right now for two reasons. One, because I went to Hudson Valley for two years, super cheap. That's pretty much paid off already. So that's two years done. So basically now I just have the time here at Cortland, which is a little more expensive, but Cortland's not that bad as a, a, a state school. Mm -hmm. If you were to go out of state. Or a private school. Or a private school, you can really get yourself into some trouble there. Um, that comes back to what I said earlier. If, you're, if you don't know what you want to do, I would not recommend to go out of state or go to a private school if you're not sure what you want to do because then you have that problem of getting into debt and not being able to get out of it. And it's just a super stressful situation that you don't want to put yourself in as a young kid, you know? It's just like you have no concept of how much debt school really will amount to in the end. My view on it is kind of different. The way I look at it, do what you want now. Take out those loans, you'll find a way to pay it back later. When you're, when you're situated with a career, you can worry about it. Right now, I'm worried about my education. Money is my last concern. I take loans out every year. Every year. I do get some scholarship money, but for the most part, it's about 15000 a year that I have to take out loans. So I'm about $60,000 in debt right now. But I don't even bat an eye. Because I'm doing what I love. And when I'm a distinguished doctor, <laughs> I'll pay it back. So. Um, the last thing I just want to show you guys, Dr. Curtis thought it would be interesting. Um, this is my weekly schedule. Um, like I said, I like to be busy. My days start around 9 or 10 a.m. And I come home around 9 or 10 p.m. So I'm about going for about 12 hours every day. Only, only five days a week, though. I'm off on weekends sometimes. Um, but I'm actually only taking 12 credits. 12 credits is the bare minimum to be considered a 
full-time student to get awarded financial aid and to get scholarships. So this is my 12 credits. I'm only in class Monday, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. So only three days a week, which is super cool. And when I made my schedule, I was like, this is going to be the best semester. I'm going to have so much free time. I got a dog. And I was like, oh my god. And now, I'm over here and I'm like, this is my craziest semester ever. I have all this free time, but I forgot about all of the other things I do. So, I'm only in class Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, but I have mentor meetings every Tuesday and Thursday before classes. I work in one of the dining halls for four hours on Tuesday as well. <coughs> also, Tuesday is a big day that I do my research with Dr. Curtis. Thursday mornings is a big day that I do my research with Dr. Ironman. Fridays I come in and do research all day long, even though I don't have classes. And then Monday nights I run a chemistry workshop for an hour and a half to help Gen Chem students. So, even though, I don't really know what I'm trying to say here. This is just what a typical Time involved schedule looks like if you were interested in something. Now, if you don't get into extracurriculars, you'd only have three days of classes. But it's so important to get involved in campus because you'll just fall in love with your college even more. So I love Portland. Forever a red dragon. <laughs> but yeah, that's it. <laughs>